Hello, and welcome to Asset Leadership Network Thursday at 4. Thank you all for being here on this August 27th, 2020. I'm Nick Kenoki, the producer of ALN Thursday at 4, where every Thursday at 4, we put a light on important and relevant asset leadership and asset management topics. Um, one note before we begin, if you have any questions, uh, please write them in the chat so we can answer them at the end or more presently. Uh, and now without further ado, let me introduce Mike Bordenero and Moshe Nelson. Hi, thank you, Nick. Uh, and uh, before we get started, I wanna do a special shout out to Giuliani and Associates. Uh, Joe Giuliani is doing great work with uh, his team there to uh, help us with uh, production. And I'm very happy today to be uh, speaking with uh, Nelson, uh, Moshe Nelson. And it's great to, uh, be involved with uh, somebody who says some of the things that I think, and that doesn't happen too often in meetings. So I uh, really appreciate uh, him uh, being involved in uh, Asset Leadership Network. And we like to start off by uh, finding out uh, how people got involved in this level of their asset management journey. Sure, well, Mike uh, and uh, Alan and, and all uh, members, thank you so much for uh, inviting me and taking the time to, to listen today uh, and then have a, a good dialogue. Um, so that's a great question. You know, how did we come to asset management or how did I get to asset management? Uh, and, you know, quite frankly, uh, I'm in management consulting. I'm a principal with Grant Thornton. And uh, years ago, I was assigned to a client that, you know, within their asset management division who had issues with uh, their fleet program uh, or the property program. Uh, they were walking in new to the division and uh, you know, they needed a, a smart management consultant to come in and help assess it. And you know, that, that really started my, my journey in asset management, seeing how you can make such a significant impact with um, a client. And this was within the federal government. Uh, and I saw when you change the tangible artifacts on the ground and the assets that are being utilized to, you know, in this case, achieve the mission, um, you can really affect people's lives. You can affect the world and, you know, really gained a passion for asset management as a result and started tying those pieces together and applying it in different places um, and watching and, and seeing the impact for the, the general public, the private sector, healthcare. It's just really amazing the reach that you have in the asset management community. So that's, that was uh, how I got into it. How did you find out about ISO 55,000? Oh, that's a, it's, it's a great question. Um, so a, a little bit of luck where, you know, we were, uh, one of my colleagues was at a conference and uh, had met uh, Jack Kelly, uh, who uh, was at a similar conference and, and, you know, I think they were both waiting in the hall for uh, a session to start and struck up a conversation and you know, Jack quickly introduced, I mean, you gotta give Jack credit, someone who can introduce 55,000 to, and this person was not an asset management practitioner and get them to become a believer within, within minutes. Um, That's so our Jack. Jack. Yeah, yeah, Jack, Jack met my colleague and said, hey, you need to meet Moshe. He leads our asset management practice. Uh, this was years ago now. And uh, I think you'll, you'll share common beliefs on you know, how to improve asset management in the system. So it was that introduction and then uh, you know, integrating into Asset Leadership Week where you know, I met a lot of people with common thoughts. Excellent, yeah. excellent. So um, we're gonna be talking about uh, your work with the National Asset Leadership Strategy at ALN and uh, your work with the ALN's uh, Federal Law Enforcement Group. But uh, before we get into that, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do at Grant Thornton? Sure. So as I mentioned before, I'm a principal at Grant Thornton. Uh, I manage our asset, manage, asset management solutions. And what that is, is essentially our solution set um, within the public sector. So, you know, asset management in private sector finance is an entirely different story. We're talking about physical assets yeah. here, of course. Um, and it's all our services focused within the facilities, property, you know, even digital asset environment. Uh, so I lead teams across uh, the federal government uh, from civilian to, to defense uh, and intelligence 
uh, to be able to provide you know, services that improve asset management. Uh, and at times it's helping clients, well, I should say it's always helping clients think through asset management in terms of ISO 55,000. At times it's tactically helping them develop new technologies to better manage assets, data analytics, supply chain management, vendor management. So um, I oversee the development of our new solutions, our, our teams, and then ensuring that we can continuously uh, you know, serve our clients well and bring them the best services and across the federal sector. Well, that explains why you jumped into the national asset leadership strategy so quickly and so forcefully. You understand its value. So why don't you explain to people uh, how uh, the national asset leadership strategy is developing now? There's quite a history, but uh, where is it? Uh, as of our meeting earlier today. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, I'll give 30 seconds on the history. And this is, has to do with the uh, perception that we as asset management practitioners uh, you know, have in the world. We, we walk around with asset management goggles on, right? Wherever we go, we start to see things on how the assets are uh, depreciating before our eyes or being invested <laughs> in, right? We, we drive over a road and we're wondering how long it's been there, when the refresh rate is, so on and so forth. Um, yes. So when we started the, the NALS, the National Asset Leadership Strategy, um, you know, over a year now, it was really with the understanding of the importance that asset management has on achieving national objectives, right? And helping the country and the United States uh, bring together the, uh, assets and industries and private and public sector in a way that achieves you know national objectives and asset management objectives as well so uh you know our now's one effort was about you know launching uh iso 55000 and its relationship with national asset management it's really an educational process uh, mm -hmm. And that was, I think, very successful. We, we had a, a great um, review from Bloomberg and uh, it was met with uh, a lot of, uh, of positive, um, you know, reception at the Hill. But, you know, the yeah. question was, now what, right? So what do we do with this knowledge? The ISO 55,000 exists, but what does that matter? So NALS 2 is essentially the so what, right? It's taking the principles of ISO 55000 and focusing them on sector specific areas so that we can provide actionable decisions to important uh, uh, constituents. And those constituents may be policy, they may be the general public, uh, private public sector. So it's just, um, it's essentially step two. And the, so what? What do, what do we do now knowing that ISO 55000 can make a significant impact on the national economy, on the health and safety of the United States, on disaster preparedness, right? Yeah, my thought is, yeah, my thought is the uh, strategy is on, on the big level, use ISO 55,000. Just that's, that could be the national strategy wherever you can. Of course, that's too simple and clean, you know, but, uh, the uh, team is uh, working uh, to establish some of the key benefits, the sell, you know, the, the main points, and uh, and put together, uh, compile the uh, list of people who are actively doing this already, so that we can go to, uh, like you said, all the different constituents, and bring them that information. So it's a really complex process. Yeah. Uh, do you? take something as complex as a national strategy that hasn't existed before and write it in a way that people will say, yeah, this makes sense. What are some of the techniques and approaches that the team is using? Yeah, I think uh, the first part is making sure that we have a diverse constituency that's contributing to the development of uh, national asset leadership strategy. Uh, so breaking it apart in, into focused areas like sectors and then ensuring that there's representation from within that sector, whether it's academia, private sector, and public sector, 
um, is the first part, right? Identifying who are the right individuals that could uh, provide input that matter, that uh, will result in actionable decisions. You're gonna say Anybody something? interested can <laughs> send an email to info at assetleadership.net and put N-A-L-S in the subject line and we'll get you involved. That's, that's right. Um, yeah. the, and then the next piece is creating that framework, uh, really developing the questions that help guide a, a small user group or a, a team to impart their knowledge, right? Their perspectives on why it matters, why their sector matters, whereas the, the energy sector, or the water sector, um, and what is the need, right? That starting with that problem statement, uh, what are the problems that exist within this sector? And you know, I'll be talking about law enforcement and we'll get into federal law enforcement, we'll get into that in a bit. And um, then determining how you can use the construct of 55,000 to be able to improve that sector. You know, it's thinking in terms of the attributes of 55,000 with you know, data, metrics, risk, vision, value, you know, things of that nature. The ability to demonstrate how to spend money better. There's right. actual mechanisms in there to show that uh, we can uh, use the resources that we have already and get more, uh, maximize the value out of it. That's right. That's good. Um, so, um, the, the NALS is taking an important role in the um, fall forum, Restructuring America, which will be uh, starting in October. We'll have uh, sector uh, programs of 90 minutes or uh, throughout uh, October. You can also go to the website, www.assetleadership.net to find out more about that. Um, so how is NALS helping shape the forum and guiding some of the discussion that will be occurring there. Yeah, well, I, I think what the NALS is doing is allowing us to think beforehand of, you know, what are the, the changes necessary, um, you know, as we, we move into 2021 um, and, uh, you know, address institutional problems that have existed in the asset management uh, environment, right, for, for some time. Uh, we're in a strategic pause. Well, I call it a strategic pause, but this is the big pause, right? With COVID-19, people are, are at an inflection point. And just naturally, due to the, the cyclical nature of um, administrations and, and changes, uh, this is the time where uh, no matter, you know, what political parties in the White House come 2021, um, you know, you start over, right? You, there's a, another four years of executing upon a strategy. So at this point, if we're talking about the nows now and taking advantage of that strategic pause to think of how do we apply the best practices in 55,000 to line up um, any transition to be effective in 2021, then you know, we're using time wisely. And, uh, you know, I, and I think effectively given you know, where we're at. Yeah, in just a second, we'll be talking about a sector, the federal law enforcement asset management sector. Uh, but let's uh, give the, the viewers an example of a sector that could use a national strategy. We were talking today at our NALS meeting about water, clean water, and everyone's familiar with Flint, Michigan. But not everybody realizes that Flint, Michigan is one of only thousands of municipalities in the country that has led problems. That is clearly a national problem. And without a strategy for addressing this, there will be not as effective use of the resources. So our, the water sector, water and wastewater sector will be addressing some of that. Um, so why don't we talk a little bit about uh, the federal law enforcement group that you set up and then about how it's going to uh, 
be a demonstration of once there's a strategy, how does the sector respond? Yeah, well, uh, late uh, last calendar year, uh, we were able to bring together uh, stakeholders who, you know, uh, at all levels of the organizations hadn't really been able to, to work with what, each other on the level that they wanted to, or they can just due to time um, and, you know, institutional constraints of, of agency. So the, what kind of stakeholders? Yeah, so the, uh, we, we stood up a federal law enforcement asset management uh, working group, and it's essentially asset management uh, practitioners from across federal law enforcement agencies who such uh, as are, such as uh, we had representation from uh, ATF, ICE, CBP, DHS, or rather, Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, uh, Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, Department of Justice, FBI too, right? I'm sorry? FBI? Yes, FBI too. Yeah, so just so people understand the, the type of stakeholders, okay. Yeah, and it's a diverse group of stakeholders uh, with very different missions, uh, even though they uh, all, you know, uh, operate in a law enforcement environment uh, between the Department of Justice um, and Homeland Security, and as well as agriculture, right? Uh, Forest Service, uh, excuse me, Forest Service, I, I know has a law enforcement arm. Um, and and what, what we've done and what I've been able to see, you know, uh, being at Grant Thornton for 14 years and working in this environment, were common problems that existed, um, or that exist rather, for many of these organizations. And we coalesce them together so that A, Practitioners at the same level can meet one another in an environment where we're discussing, you know, asset management best practices. And we had uh, speakers at our, our event, which were uh, fantastic, that were able to, you know, bring real life examples as well as show, you know, what technology, what, uh, what's the evolution of asset management innovation that can be brought into the federal uh, law enforcement arena given the mm -hmm. unique aspects of their missions. And, you know, one thing that's uh, extremely unique for that the federal law enforcement asset management community has been facing is for years, the idea of resiliency and agility, right? The, the lives, uh, the, the operations of federal law enforcement uh, agencies change you know, rapidly across geographies, across seasons at any given time. So asset management, wow. yeah, I mean, think about it. I mean, asset management uh, has to be extremely dynamic to be able to respond to changes that, uh, that are occurring. And those changes can be, um, you know, based upon environmental factors like a hurricane uh, I, you know, lived through Hurricane Andrew back in a, the early 90s uh, in South Florida, and there were significant uh, humanitarian as well as law enforcement concerns when all of the power goes out, right? All yeah. your infrastructure shuts down, and you need to make sure that basic operations can occur and um, that, you know, things are uh, safe and, and the general public is, is able to live their lives. So it's always been a very dynamic environment, which is why I love operating and working with it. Fantastic clients that are just used to change. And as a change maker, hmm. as, and as a management consultant, that's the world I live in, right? Nothing is static. Yeah. And right. the idea of ISO 55000 that creates the framework in which you can manage change, you can prepare for change, uh, it makes complete sense. So we brought these stakeholders together they were able to meet each other uh, and, you know, an immediate benefit was collaborate through informal uh, connections as well as formal connections. And, um, you know, and then uh, ostensibly look towards making a, a more, you know, con concerted effort to integrate 55,000 principles. And we see that happening. So uh, for- Can you give us an example? Sure, sure. Well, um, you know, we talked about uh, certain, uh, you know, Department of Homeland Security uh, agencies have, have started to adopt ISO 55,000 principles. 
right? Awesome. Um, yeah, and you'll, you know, we've, we've seen presentations on um, the implementation of metrics-based decisions, data-based decisions, um, looking at the entire uh, ecosystem. I think DHS has done a, has come a long way in being able to have coordinated efforts again uh, across diverse stakeholders like FEMA as well as uh, CBP or Coast Guard or FPS. Right? Mm -hmm. These are all mm -hmm. very dynamic and diverse uh, constituencies. So you know, as as uh, fifty five thousand knowledge has you know made its way across the federal government, it's being adopted and then integrated in, into operations slowly, right? It's, it, it is a, a big beast and it's a, it's a process, but at least it uh, provides that vision. Okay, so um, there's been uh, great uh, traction from the start. Um, what do you think uh, the law enforcement group will uh, be able to um, demonstrate or show related to the national asset leadership strategy? Or yeah. it has to evolve with the team and you don't want to be uh, seeding it. Sure. I, I think um, no, it's, a, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, this time of the year, everybody's uh, busy sort of closing out the end of the fiscal year. Um, but what I would guess, based upon the discussions that we had at the end of last calendar year, is, you know, greater collaboration and best practice sharing in the areas that are relevant to ISO 55000 and strategic asset management planning, right? So what are those areas on risk, on common metrics, on standards, taxonomy? You know, I think we're going to see more, uh, more of that communication and then benefits being achieved across stakeholder groups uh, within the community. So that's what I will guess because I know that they've uh, individually have come uh, along since we last met. Um, and there will be a lot more of that uh, probably best practice sharing and, and continued collaboration and communication. That's, that's just my guess. Excellent. Yeah, um, they all have different uh, missions, but they all drive vehicles. So that's right. be a lot that is shared, you know, on just that one. Well, vehicles here. and, you know, boats and aircraft and, you know, right. buildings and technology. So um, really quickly, uh, I want to uh, thank you for uh, earlier this year when we were involved in presentations on uh, personal protective equipment. And can you say a little bit about what might be helpful in the future um, so that you can have face masks or, or yeah. things like any, any thoughts on uh, how that has developed or could uh, be improved sure. uh, in terms of federal? Yeah, I, I think, and I'll speak generally, uh, even beyond federal, because I, you know, I, I have seen a bit in the private sector healthcare as, as well as uh, state and local. Um, you know, the trend that we saw with uh, personal protective equipment or PPE uh, initially when COVID broke out was a, a bit of a trying to understand what was the infrastructure, what were the data, what were the processes in place to first account for the PPE, right? So that you can ensure you knew how much you have. And then how does the supply chain look? What is the vendor base? Um, how do I get you know, PPE on contract? What, is the, uh, what are some of the holdups as a result of you know, uh, borders uh, essentially shutting down due to, uh, you know, COVID-19 health risks. Uh, in some cases, uh, obviously opening back up later, but it is slower throughput. So in the first part of this pandemic, there was just trying to get the lay of the land, understand what systems and data and processes exist. Then we saw, you know, basically an understanding of where everyone was at. And, uh, you know, many, obviously many agencies in the federal government were able to quickly Get their resources coalesce together uh, and you know establish uh, processes um, analytical capabilities forecasting capabilities and vendor relationships fairly quickly for those that were collaborating right which was which was very interesting um, 
I think as we move into you know, the, the fall and we can expect a, an additional uptick as just a result of we're getting to seasonality, that's a guess, right? I'm, I'm not in the healthcare sector, but that's what the literature is saying. Um, mm -hmm. There'll be less of trying to get a bearing of, you know, how are we managing this as asset management pr practitioners? Because we now know uh, there are, in many cases, there are processes in, in place and there'll be, uh, you know, I think further investments or resources made to ensure that the, the supply chain of PPE um, is, uh, you know, better sought out, better managed, and more collaboration uh, occurring between organizations. And I think that's the, the, the piece that we're at, right? So during the height of the pandemic, at, at least from um, the initial outsets, People were trying to understand and gain resources so that they can complete, you know, uh, the healthcare jobs or the, the missions within the federal government or state and local uh, ser services. Um, there was a little bit of now rebaselining and understanding this is actually what we need because in some cases we figured out we can operate in a remote environment. We don't need to all be in this building. Therefore, we all do not need this amount of PPE. Let's adjust that factor. Let's order more or order less and yeah. allow for redistribution of uh, resources across the supply chain. So I think that, that all of that is uh, coming together now uh, and will be factors that uh, we'll have to deal with as we come into the fall, but thinking through those problems. Not very passionate on the subject, are you? <laughs> it's a lot of great people working on it, um, you know, and I know. I, I can't tell you how many hours and weeks, uh, nights and weekends uh, people have spent, uh, you know, just making sure that everyone is safe. Uh, and it's people have, have really sacrificed health, family, um, you know, and uh, a lot of sacrifice just to be able to help others. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, well, thanks for your work on that. And I think Nick has some questions. I do. Thank you so much so far, Moshe. And if we have a few questions and if you wouldn't mind trying to respond to them, you know, in a minute or so. Um, the first one is, do you think that for asset management to be nationally successful, it needs to be, needs a supportive financial accounting system? Um, uh, that is the basis of accounting should slash could be accrual, not cash question mark. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, it, there's, there's so many aspects to that, that question. And I'm not an accountant, so I'm not, you know, I do work for an accounting firm, but I'm not, I, I'm not a CPA. I will put that, uh, put that out up front. Um, but, you know, one of the, the biggest issues that I've seen across client bases is that asset management systems and financial management systems are different. And clients are essentially running their assets in one system. It's not tying to the financial management system of record. So when you're going through the inventory or you're trying to depreciate assets um, with ease, it's extremely challenging. Uh, and it's extremely challenging to account for it on, a, on an annual basis because of what is a technology system issue, partly, right? Um, so there is significant uh, opportunity to improve the accounting of assets based upon some techno technological improvements and standardization of systems in and of themselves and the processes by which those systems exist. And I can, I can tell you that, you know, money is uh, poured into audit remediation efforts, uh, you know, across the United States because of that fundamental issue of uh, technological systems not talking to one another. So I think that, you know, this question also hits upon how the assets are being managed uh, and how asset management offices work with the finance offices typically separate to account for these assets on the books. And uh, it, it's extremely challenging uh, for many stakeholders who don't have that unified system. And I'm not plugging any, any specific software. There are great softwares out there, there are great systems. That alone does not solve it. The accounting is necessary uh, to make it beneficial. Um, and the processes in themselves, but we have to recognize the problem. Um, thank you so much for taking that question. And I just want to briefly say that our 30 minutes is up. So if people have to go, that's fine. But I'm going to stay and ask another question or two, if that's okay with you, Moshe.
Sure, of course. Um, one question is, how do you think asset management will have to adapt going forward with the world different as we're experiencing COVID-19? You know, um, I think that there is a, a rare moment where asset managers uh, or people that work within asset management have the ability to shine during COVID-19. Um, and this is one of the most, um, you know, beneficial things that I have done in my career has been during this period where we've been able to help through asset management practices, through 55,000, through our knowledge of, of infrastructure and analytics, field PPE, for example, to the places that need it most at the time that they need it. Uh, so that's one answer. The second piece to that goes back to the agility and the resiliency that's necessary. So asset management itself will have to become a more resilient and nimble planning operation, right? Oftentimes we think of 30 year capital plans, which are necessary, right? To, to make large term investments and receive payback. But we also have to take into, effect, into account the changing and dynamic nature that COVID-19 has made people uh, aware of. And if you've worked at all within the federal government, for the past decade, you would know that it has become um, less of a fluid environment, right? Government shutdowns, uh, you know, operating on continuing resolutions, um, there, the need to become agile to respond to how the operations have been uh, undertaken within the asset management environment has become a necessity, not a choice. So I think that's going to be one of the, the primary changes to the asset management practice is the ability to be more agile, to think in scenarios rather than in long-term, you know, finite plans. Makes the sense. interesting thing about COVID is that it's done it on a national and global level. Right. We have seen the situational requirements for that agility, like you mentioned, uh, Sandy, and, you know, just today, uh, Laura, you know, we're seeing the fires and the floods but this is getting us a national focus. And it's bold to say it, but I think the Asset Leadership Network has an answer for how to proceed out of into this new world. And that's through a, stand, a systematic standardized approach to asset management, so. Well, Mike, and I would also say, uh, and this was uh, amazing during the uh, webinar we did with the healthcare facilities that were, you know, there were constituents located in California. And we were able to quickly share best practices uh, related to asset management, things that we're doing here on the, on the East Coast that people can start applying tomorrow, right? So I think ALN uh, provides that collaborative environment where individuals can share best practices, uh, you know, can collaborate on resourcing effectively in this environment. And that's, that says a lot about the organization. Well, thank you for being a strong and ad, uh, powerful advocate for the organization. Look forward to uh, uh, continuing working with you and more discussions. We'll have to have you back on Thursday at four in the future. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. This is uh, it's always a great opportunity to speak with you guys. Um, do you have time for one or two more questions? Or... Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, one question was, how can we depoliticize asset management and can ISO 55,000 help with that? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's amazing because the infrastructure bills um, on the Hill tend to be the you know, most bipartisan uh, you know, bills that, that are put out there. So if there's any, er any area uh, within industry that you can reach common ground, it's, it's assets, right? It's asset management. Um, now, I'm sure there's different variants of which asset you're talking about or what to focus on, um, you know, one, uh, one item at a time. But I think that the, the work through the National Asset Leadership Strategy, the NALS, where we're talking about how do you put a prioritization methodology in place that is not based upon, um, you know, necessarily uh, subjective measures, and those can be political or they can be otherwise, but based upon what's necessary to achieve national objectives, that's how you get to 
a you know a nonpartisan approach and it's you know it, it's putting that accountability that methodology in place where you eliminate the subjectivity um so that, that would be my recommendation I'm great doing it. Yeah. great um and last question uh is it too complex to point city mayors for example to use the astm's uh, e3210 on infrastructure management uh, and its support of the ISO 55000 to address the current um, zeitgeist to defund the police? Is it too political? Um, that was a question. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I don't know about that. I think any time, what I can say is part of that question, anytime you could recommend best practice principles of ASTM or ISO 55000 for asset management period, it's good. And it's going to help asset management. Now, as, as far as um, you know, political decisions, decision making or, or uh, references. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, we'll, right. we'll leave the political side of that uh, alone. But uh, let me do address um, that the ASTM E3210 is a standard about how to unify your thinking about multiple municipal asset classes. So it totally fits in with ISO 55000 in multiple ways. One, it says that the city is an owner and it has assets and it shouldn't think of buses separate from bridges and trains. They should think in terms of we need to move people through the city so that they can achieve their missions, you know, live their lives and do their business. And the taxonomy that's in the National Asset Leadership Strategy will be helpful in guiding people who use E3210 and use ISO 55000 together because this is about systems thinking. And uh, that standard is very good of laying out the municipal uh, assets, including education, is one of the assets that they uh, list in that. Not the buildings, but education of the people. So um, that's being spearheaded by ALN senior fellow Marty Rowland, who's really far advanced in thinking about complex things that many people can't even get their heads around. Yeah. But, Thank you, uh, Marty. <laughs> yeah, go, Marty. Well, uh, we're out of questions and out of time. So uh, I just wanted to share this screen again. Uh, Motion Nelson, thank you so much for being here. Um, and again, I, I don't know if I said this initially, but these are our organizational members. This wouldn't be possible without them. Um, thank you all so much for coming and being here today. Uh, if you wanna continue any of these conversations, feel free to reach out to us personally or um, email us at webinar at assetleadership.net. Um, other than that, I think we'll, we'll end. Thank you guys. All right. Thanks for the opportunity. Right. Thanks everybody.